This is Software Engineering Radio, the podcast for professional developers on the web at se-radio.net. SE Radio is brought to you by the IEEE Computer Society and by IEEE Software Magazine. Online at computer.org slash software. Support for SE Radio comes from the O'Reilly Velocity Conference. Join over 2,000 developers and engineers in San Jose from June 19th through the 22nd to learn how resilience engineering can make your systems more scalable, reliable, and efficient. Get the latest on containers, microservices, infrastructure, cloud, DevOps, systems engineering, security, and more while you meet experts and network with peers. Use discount code SE20 to save 20% on your gold, silver, or bronze pass. That's SE20. Get all the details at velocityconf.com slash CA. For Software Engineering Radio, this is Robert Blumen. Today, I have with me James Turnbull. James is the CTO at Empatico. Prior to that, he was CTO at Kickstarter and has been in leadership roles at Docker, Venmo, and Puppet Labs. James is the author of 10 books about open source software, including The Art of Monitoring, The Logstash Book, The Docker Book, The Terraform Book, and multiple books about Puppet. James, welcome back to Software Engineering Radio. Well, thank you so much for having me back. reason I say welcome back is you were on an earlier show about Docker. We'll link to that in the show notes. Today, we'll be talking mostly about Terraform, maybe some Puppet, and use that as a way to explore the area of declarative programming. Before we start, would you like to add anything about yourself that I didn't cover? Uh, no, I do have a funny accent for those people about to listen. So it's, uh, I'm originally from Australia. So uh, anyone who is uh, puzzled about what, what I'm saying, just slow it down and uh, you should be able to get everything. Mm. We have listeners all over the world. It's about 40% in the U.S. So I'm sure people are used to dealing with all kinds of English accents. But thanks for the clarification. I'm going to start out with Terraform. What is Terraform, and what problem does it solve? So Terraform is uh, an open source tool written by the team at HashiCorp, who uh, you may be familiar with, who uh, have a number of open source projects, including uh, Console, which is a service discovery tool, and probably most known to developers, uh, Vagrant, which is a, a local um, virtual machine environment that uh, a lot of developers use to set up local testing and local development environments. Uh, Terraform itself is uh, an infrastructure management tool. So essentially, inside the sort of infrastructure management world, there's a concept called infrastructure as code, which is essentially a way of saying if you want to build things like servers and services, then you can uh, codify those uh, in, in, a, in some format. Um, Puppet does a similar thing. Uh, and Terraform consumes that, that code, uh, connects to a bunch of infrastructure services and infrastructure tools, and spits out configured services. For example, very common, commonly used in the AWS Amazon world, where you can say, I'd like to have an EC2 instance, and it needs to be configured this way and have this particular uh, set of attributes. And so I create a Terraform configuration that configures it, and I launch that configuration, and Terraform goes off to Amazon and creates me the required infrastructure. I wanted to mention to our listeners, we have done shows on console vagrant Docker and infrastructure as code. I'll link to all those in the show notes. Now, back to our discussion, I have worked at jobs where when we wanted infrastructure on Amazon, we would go onto their console, press some buttons, or run a script that hits their API. Why is a Terraform approach possibly better than those other approaches to creating infrastructure? There's a couple of principal reasons. Um, the first one is that when you go onto the console and press all those buttons and create that infrastructure, let's say uh, you accidentally delete some of that infrastructure and one of your colleagues has to go back and recreate it all. He has to basically retrace or she has to retrace your steps through the console and click all the right buttons and make all the right configuration changes. And if you ever use the Amazon console, it's a fairly complex set of applications and services. You know, for example, I think the EC2 tab inside the AWS console probably has 40 configuration items on it, each you know, driving, driving down to sub menus. So 
what Terraform does is allows you to say, instead of you going to the console, you can actually declaratively describe. You can describe the state of your infrastructures you want. I'd like an EC2 instance. Uh, I would like an RDS instance uh, for my database. Uh, I would like some uh, an elastic load balancer as my load balancer. And I would like it to be configured in this particular way with these ports open and, and these this particular specific configuration of memory and disk and so on. And then I can create it. Uh, and the next type of person that comes along can replicate that configuration technically because essentially it's like a manifest of the source code. And that sort of leads to the second reason, which is that it becomes something you can actually make part of your source code. So instead of thinking about like your source code as purely the, the code that drives your application, you start to think of source code as the things that builds your infrastructure upon which you're going to install your application and upon which you're going to sort of deploy it. And that opens up a whole very interesting world around uh, the concept of uh, infrastructure testing, um, infrastructure continuous delivery, and continuous pipelines for infrastructure. I understand from your description that Terraform consumes source code that developers create. Podcast is not a great medium for discussing source code, but could you give a little bit of a feeling of what kind of source code Terraform takes as input? Sure. So Terraform has two inputs. One is called HCL, which is a which is a uh, a HashiCorp produced configuration language. So it's effectively a HashiCorp DSL. It's very close to, um, if you think about it, it looks like uh, probably the closest equivalent is JSON, which is the other language that Terraform will consume. So you can write your configuration, your, your infrastructure source in JSON or in, in this HCL language, which is kind of like a more human readable form of JSON. I think everyone's familiar with uh, dropping a comma here and there in JSON and JSON linting is a non-trivial problem. HCL is, is, a, is a way of, of presenting a more human readable version of, of JSON. Use the term DSL, that would be domain specific, specific language. language. I apologize, I should have clarified That's that. okay. Uh, it's kind of my job to, to make sure the terms get defined. I mentioned that because we've had some shows on that as well, so I'm gonna link to those. Now, suppose that I want to build three different database clusters in my environment, and they're kind of similar, but they differ in some minor ways, does Terraform offer anything like a function call or module where I can run the same code more than once, not exactly the same way each time? It certainly does. Um, so one of the really attractive things about Terraform is that it is a modular environment. So I can, for example, create a default RDS or database, uh, in the case of Dataverse or database module that configures the standard things I care about in my database, the base configuration. I can then parameterize some items in that configuration. For example, I could say uh, the, data, the size of the database, for example. I could say that I would like to run it on this particular size in test, this particular size in staging, and then a much larger box for production. When I do my Terraform configuration, I can include the database module, and I can parameterize it based on where I am. So, for example, I say if I'm running in the development environment, and that may be you know, set up with a an environment variable or maybe a bit of something a, a variable you're passing into the into your configuration somewhere or queried from a, a data store of some kind i pass in that variable saying this is the production environment and based on that variable terraform makes a number of decisions about how it's going to configure that database you could have three environments like many shops qa staging and production but you don't need to have three really similar almost identical sets of Terraform files in order to build out those three environments then. That's quite right. Okay. You mentioned three very interesting applications for this. One was infrastructure testing. Talk about that. So I think one of the really interesting things about um, the sort of change in the way we've deployed infrastructure over the years is that it's become closer to the sort of software development world rather than sort of Previous in the past, just sort of sysadmins and operations people really didn't have a lot of software development practices in the way they built infrastructure and the way they managed the, the, that infrastructure. And one of the things that we've picked up from the, the software development community, for example, is, is version control. So very rarely do you find environments these days where sysadmins are not putting configuration into version control. One of the interesting things that came out of that and the concept of infrastructure as code is that we thought, okay, there are some other good software development practices that maybe we can adopt. 
So one of the first ones that, that sort of got looked at was testing. And it was to say that, okay, if I can write unit tests for my application source code, you know, for example, something that determines that, you know, input and input goes into this method and the output should be this thing, you know, I can write a unit test for that. Maybe I can do the same thing for my infrastructure. So I know that my infrastructure needs to be a MySQL database open on port 3306, and it needs to have uh, a user called production that when I connect to it, responds and validates my connection needs to have three databases present, maybe QA, stage, and production. So how about I write a unit test for that for each of those? And essentially what, what um, infrastructure's code allows you to do in applications like Terraform is that I can locally, in my environment, I can run my Terraform configuration, I can create my MySQL database, and then I can use a variety of, of testing tools, and there are a few of them. Uh, Test Kitchen is a, is a pretty common one. And basically what it does is it says, this infrastructure should respond to the thing it should have a test that says this infrastructure should answer on port 3306. It should have a user called production, and it should have three databases. And if it doesn't, spit out an error. Um, and what I can do is I can wrap my infrastructure build uh, in the same process that I would use my continuous deployment or continuous delivery, or even just my test cycle for my application. So when I do my deployment, for example, I go from the staging environment to production environment or the QA environment to staging, um, what I can do is that I can say, well, my infrastructure changes and my application changes are all in source code. Uh, my test my test process is that, say, my Jenkins server or my circle or whatever I happen, testing tool I use, executes my, my infrastructure tests, which builds all of the required infrastructure, the databases and load balancers and, and servers. It runs a bunch of tests to make sure they're configured correctly. Then it may run all of my infrastructure tests uh, and create my required artifacts, like a jar file or a war file, uh, and then deploy that to my freshly built infrastructure and then run all of my integration or acceptance tests. And at the end of it, I know that everything in my environment from the bottom piece of infrastructure right up to the application source code is green all the way. And I can say, okay, that's a valid build uh, and deploy it. Rather than have things that happen like my application source code, everything compiles, compiles fine, uh, all my tests pass, I create my artifacts, I deploy it in production. Turns out, you know, someone in the staging environment decided to change the name of the database, but I didn't know because I, 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 someone manually changed the staging environment that's not changing production, and my build, my deploy, or my application falls over. This starts to remove the same sort of problems that tests are designed to identify in application source code, remove those from infrastructure. I've definitely seen problems due to people making manual changes in infrastructure to get a test to work, and then it breaks when you move it to another environment. This would imply that when you adopt Terraform and you check your Terraform files into Git, you run them through this pipeline, that no one is allowed to make manual changes on the infrastructure that Terraform built. Is, is that a valid conclusion? Yeah, this is another way. Uh, one of the classic problems in an infrastructure world and, and for sysadmins is that entropy happens. Like, uh, you know, I identify a problem at three in the morning with a bit of infrastructure. I make a configuration change to it. I go back to sleep. I, I, you know, the next team, the team wakes up in the morning and, and don't realize that I've made that change. You know, and it doesn't enter a recorded history or it doesn't, there's no version control. So over time, a number of these changes accumulate. And when I go to actually sort of deploy my code again or rebuild that environment, I, there's no record of those manual changes. So all of a sudden my running environment has deviated dramatically from my, what I think the world looks like. And you know, obviously I, I then have to either replicate all of those changes or again, sort of roll forward until I have an environment that works. You know, the, the advantage of, of the sort of immutable model is that is that I can say, don't change anything in production. What, in fact, what I want to do is I want to change things in my source code and then redeploy. Okay, so the infrastructure is immutable, but it needs to change over time for many reasons. How do you manage those changes to ensure that they don't create instability? So the way to manage those changes is to treat them like any sort of software patch or software update. You maintain them in your source code, follow the same protocol you used to make application source changes. So you know you are, you make a change, you test that it works, you create a pull request, someone code reviews it, you merge the code, you deploy it into your testing environment, uh, you build that environment, you run your tests and so on and so forth. So you actually treat it exactly with like a, a bit of software source code and then you actually treat the changes the same way. So 
if it's all in version control, um, I, you know, I have a commit which contains uh, my latest infrastructure build. I just push that commit out to my tool, whether it be Terraform or something like that, and it automatically rebuilds or changes the environment to suit what I, you know what the change I want to make. Uh, obviously, it's not possible in every environment, but it's very attractive for environments like containerized environments with tools like Docker, where the infrastructure and the data where, you know, are separate, where the infrastructure is effectively stateless. You know, for example, like a, a cluster of stateless web servers or you know, a pool of middleware tools or messaging infrastructure. James, I have some experience with another tool called Puppet, which is very similar in spirit to Terraform. I don't know if we'll end up talking about that a lot today, but it runs on a single server and it ensures that all your configuration files have the correct value. If you go and manually edit a config file, you'll find after the next Puppet run that Puppet has replaced it with mm -hmm. whatever it's supposed to be. Do you have the same model in Terraform where you tell it, this is what I want the world to look like, and if the world isn't exactly like that, it will apply some diffs to the world to make it look like what was specified? Yeah, Terraform actually has a lot in common with Puppet. That they have a very similar heritage. And Mitchell Hashimoto, who wrote a lot of, or was you know, the architect of a lot of the HashiCorp tools, was a very long time Puppet user uh, and very familiar with the stack. So like Puppet, Terraform is a model-based system. So essentially what it does is uh, it has two modes. One's a plan mode and the other one's an apply mode, pretty much like Puppet's no-op and apply modes. So what it does is uh, I can make a change to the infrastructure, like I might, might maybe I'll change the, the size of, a, of an EC2 instance. I then run Terraform in its plan mode, and it re Terraform will reach out to AWS and say, that instance uh, is actually this other size on, on the, in the infrastructure. If you apply this configuration, I'm going to change the size of that instance. And then you know I can determine whether that's a change I'm comfortable making, in which case I run Terraform in its apply mode, and I'll update all of my changes. But it allows me to do things like model changes. So I can say, if I change this, this, and this, I run Terraform in its plan mode, and it spits out a list of the changes that it's going to make. And if you like them, you say, I'm OK with that. And then it makes them in the yeah. apply mode. Correct. Great. We've been talking a lot so far about Terraform and infrastructure. The show has a long history of doing many shows on programming languages. I wanted to approach this topic from a programming language standpoint. Terraform is an example of, of declarative programming, and we're going to talk more in depth about that. Let's start with imperative programming, which most people learn their first programming language will be an imperative language. What is an imperative programming language? Um, well, at the simplest form, an imperative programming language is something like like Bash, or shell scripts, or, or Ruby, or Python. Essentially, what it is is, is when you, whenever you tell the application that you give it, you, you write down the steps you're going to take. So that an imperative program is where, simply for example, actually, I like to use this like a imperative programs are a bit like a, a checklist. So what you do is you say, in order to achieve the result I want, I, I need I need a bunch of steps. So step one, uh, I create an object. Step two, I make some change to the object. Step three. I delete the object. And in a declarative world, I only care about the end state of the object. So instead of writing down all the steps, I tell the, I tell the application, I would like uh, an object, and it should look like this. And then I, worry, I let the, the program or the application worry about the details, those steps. I don't tell it it needs to create, you know, I, I don't tell it, it need, that in order to create, you need to do this, this, and this. I just say, I want this object. And I assume that under the covers, the application knows what it needs to do. Declarative languages are fairly popular. I don't know if people think of them in this way, but could you give examples that you think people have already used? Um, I think the classic one that people probably don't realize is a declarative language is pretty much any database query language. So SQL, for example, is, is a declarative language. Um, you're saying to in an SQL statement, now, I would like to select all of the records that meet this criteria. You don't know what's going to happen underneath the covers, often to your detriment when, when a, a query goes disastrously wrong. But essentially what you're saying is, I want this data set from this source with this set of, set of criteria. 
you don't know what the what the database engine is doing under the surface to to grab the records from the right tables and the right fields and munch data and all sorts of stuff. All you're saying is I want this data set. Uh, regular expressions uh, are a similar thing, probably not quite as precise an analogy, but but a similar sort of construct. And a lot of functional programming uh, languages where you know you're trying to avoid mutation of some kind or, or you know, where you're actually saying that you know I want my, my base function, I want to achieve some, some results. I don't really care how I get that result as long as it, it does this. Why do you think the declarative model is a good model for the problem domain of Terraform? I think it's because, uh, I, no, I, 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 will, I will give the facetious answer first, which is that all sysadmins are inherently lazy people. And if I don't have to remember which part of the AWS console to go to, or which 10 AWS API endpoints and all of the variables to pass them in order to create the, the stack of things that I, I want, then no, I, 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 I won't. Like, if I, all I have to do is say I would like an AWS environment that looks like this, and Terraform does and goes and creates it for me, that saves me a lot of stuff that I would otherwise have to puzzle out on my own. I rely on the, the vendor, in this case HashiCorp and, and the, the members of the open source community to you know, be able to remember the detail of how that infrastructure works. I don't have to care about it. There's a similar reason that Puppet is very popular with sysadmins is that if you work in a Linux or a Unix environment, you don't have to remember how a bunch of commands work or more importantly, the differences between those commands across multiple systems. For example, uh, starting and stopping services on Red Hat, Ubuntu, uh, Debian and Fedora vary between versions. So I have to remember like, how do I, how do I start and stop a service or how do I manage that, that service um, across three different distributions, across four different versions? Like if every one of those commands is subtly different. It's a waste of my time to have to remember that stuff when I can pay a computer or use a computer to do the same mechanism. So facetiously, it's because it's, it's, a, it's a productivity goal and I shouldn't have to remember that stuff. But more importantly, I think it's actually about modeling and it's about seeing the world as a, an end state that I want to achieve and converging towards that end state rather than seeing the world as a, a series of steps, which can be very easily, you know, like all checklists can be very easily broken, require inserts and updates and changes. Um, I can reason about a, a declarative world in a way that I can't in an imperative world because I know what my end state's going to be and I know what my current state is and I can measure the difference. Can you give an example? What are some ways that you could reason about a model that might be difficult if it was a, a big Ruby script? So the, the classic one to think about is firewall rules is the one I, I think about all the time. One of my very first serious jobs was managing a large scale infrastructure, including huge firewalls that made, had thousands of rules in them. And a, a subtle change in that firewall, like a script we ran to, to, to say change a bunch of IP addresses, could have dramatic implications for more than one part of the system because I, I wasn't able to actually see what else my change was impacted. So let's say, uh, let's say I changed an IP address. So it turns out that I thought the IP address was localized to this one application, but it turns out it's used in these 10 other applications. And by making that change, I break those 10 other applications because I haven't updated the IP address there. In a model-driven, in a declarative world, uh, all of my resources that have some relationship are linked together. So that IP address is a, a graph-based model world like a tool like Puppet provides. I can walk that graph and identify all of the instances, all of the nodes in that, in that graph where that, that IP address appears, um, which means that if I run that script and I ask Puppet to tell me what's going to happen if I change this IP address, it will walk the graph, find all of the nodes that are affected and tell me that those other 10 applications, that, that will also be affected and, and that change will take place. I can't do that with a, a long script, a bash or a Ruby script or something like that, because I only know what's happening at that point in time. Like 10 steps down the road, I have no idea what's gonna happen. Whereas if I can expect, look at the model and compare the state I'm in now with the state I want to achieve, I know that it's gonna have a broader impact than I anticipated. So you can think about states something like sets and you can say what is the intersection yep. between these two sets or the diff between them that's an exact thing you know, uh, the venn diagram a uh, set like the, there's, a, there's a number of metaphors that work really well for this sort of this concept and i think particularly you know, i think software developers think about this like this is quite a natural phenomenon to them the concept of, uh, of comparing a set with another set and, and the overlap between them 
this is a fairly basic construct for a lot of infrastructure people. This was a new concept when when people first started talking about infrastructure as code and, and declarative things. So, in, in many ways, it, it, you know, it's uh, for a lot of a lot of folks in the operations world, it getting getting their heads around this was a non-trivial problem. Was there a culture change that had to occur for acceptance of this approach? Yeah, there, there was, and, and I think you you touched on it earlier when you when you talked about like making manual changes to infrastructure. You know, people had to sort of say, okay, hands off. I'm actually going to let the tool, I'm going to make a change at the tool level, you know, and then, you know, rerun my, my process or my, my tool, compare the difference and then deploy that, which is what for, for the most case, you know, most software developers would think about is like, uh, there's a there's a, a spurious bit of output or the application is behaving in, a, in a, the wrong ways, is you go back to the source code, you identify the bug, you write a fix, you know, you, you, you deploy the fix or and the test or associated tests and, and you deploy it. That that whole methodology of, of, of taking that approach um, was something that infrastructure people had to adopt uh, or had to become a, accustomed to. And it's not a it's not a uh, uh, it's not a natural thing. If you're a lot of infrastructure people are very tinkery, um, like so, the natural thing is to jump on the box and make the configuration change and get things up and running again, rather than uh, treat it like you know, this is a bug, you know, I should treat it like a bug, I should write a patch, I should test that patch, I should deploy it. And I, I should say that's also often the case why people make things worse by getting on the box and making that change because they don't understand the broader implications of, of what that looks like, the simple fix. Turns out the simple fix actually made the situation worse. This is an example of the DevOps mindset bringing the sensibilities and processes from the software development world to the domain of managing systems? Very much so. Um, I, I think that uh, uh, the early, you know, um, Patrick Dubois, who was one of the early sort of folks who, who he coined the phrase DevOps, uh, was primarily a, a, a developer by trade. And when he started do, having to do some infrastructure admin work, the reason he came up with DevOps was he was like, there's a bunch of process and a bunch of way of thinking about things that are a way that could sort of advantage or help help infrastructure people do things better. Obviously, there's a collaboration piece there as well, but definitely the sort of process and tooling constructs um, were things he thought would, would be very attractive in that infrastructure world. I uh, promised a little while ago I wanted to approach this from a programming language standpoint, delve more into Terraform. You would said early on that the programmer specifies Terraform in JSON or a similar format, you feed it into Terraform, I am going to guess there's something like a compiler in a backend. Could you walk us through what happens when you say Terraform, what happens to create the end state? Sure. So I first define my um, Terraform calls them resources. So a resource can be... Um, something like a, a, an EC2 instance or a database server or a DNS entry, any form of sort of infrastructure or, or configuration that I want to build. Um, so I define that in either in a, is a JSON object or as in this HCL, uh, HashiCorp configuration language. Uh, it has a title um, uh, and the title is made up, it identifies it, the type of thing it is. So it's, um, it might be an AWS EC2 instance I give it a name, it might be my web server, and I give it a set of attributes. So I tell it that it's this EC2 instance is this big, it has this much memory, this much disk, the network is configured this way, maybe there's a piece in there that tells it how to you know, install some software, and maybe I give it some security rules, like I, I tell it like uh, these ports are open and these ports are closed. Okay, I'm gonna interrupt here. What you just described, you're summarizing what would the input look like to Correct. a particular run of Terraform. Okay, great. So keep going. So from there, Terraform has the concept of providers and providers are essentially a link to the infrastructure tool you want to work with. So for example, there's an AWS provider that connects essentially is a, is, acts as a, a wrapper around the AWS API. Okay. So essentially it provides a, a, an interface to the AWS API. So what I do is I, as part of my configuration, I define that provider as well. So I say I want to use uh, AWS to create this resource. 
and I want to say select AWS region US East 1. So it allows me to configure that. Let me stop you sure. again here. Now, all your examples so far have been AWS, but from what you're saying, Terraform does not only have the ability to create resources in AWS, it could create resources on some other kind of back end as long as the provider has the ability to talk to it programmatically. Is that right? Correct. So it supports Microsoft Azure, supports um, CenturyLink Cloud, CloudStack, uh, DigitalOcean, uh, Google Cloud, uh, Heroku. Pretty, you, you name a service, um, it, it probably supports it in some way. Um, you can do things like work with MySQL databases or work with GitHub repositories or uh, monitoring and management tools like New Relic, uh, OpenStack servers, DNS providers, um, you know, uh, you name it, there's pretty much a, a provider for each, so most of them are a piece of infrastructure. Even stuff like on-premise things like VMware, um, vSphere and vCloud Director and stuff like that. Okay, so just to summarize, and we've got the input and you've got a range of providers that know how to talk to whatever that service is and tell that service to create different resources with, and if I've requested a certain type of rule in my firewall, then your provider knows how to tell the service to implement that rule in the firewall. Correct. So what happens, um, I've got, so I've got that configuration. I, I run, like my, my traditional model is I would run the, what's called the plan command, Terraform plan. And essentially what happens there is that it tells you what it's going to do, but doesn't make any changes. So it's essentially a, a, way to, a way to model the change before you actually make it. Then if I, run, if I run that command, then Terraform sucks in my inputs, connects to my provider, and says, what's the current state of things? And Terraform has a concept of, of state, so it has a concept of what, what's happening now. If this is a brand new configuration, then the state is zero, like it doesn't have anything new. But if you've run this command before, Terraform plan before, and you've, you know, you've sucked in your inputs, there may be some existing resources. Um, and Terraform essentially applies an identifier to, to each of those resources and writes out a sort of a state file. And you can store those state files in either as a, 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 you know, a flat file or in a database or a uh, console is commonly used, for example. So it goes out, um, it checks the current state and says, you know, what's, what, 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 what's the world look at like out there? And then it says, okay, uh, we've got some, some current state, like the, the status quo, got some new things, um, let's compare and see if there's any differences. And then it identifies, it, you know, essentially it uh, treats this it essentially like a graph-based model. So it, it identifies all of the current state and the new state, works out what resources are linked to one another. For example, it knows by interrogating the Amazon API instant provider or the Azure API provider that this instance is linked to this security group or this firewall or this instance is linked to this elastic load balancer. And so it knows that certain changes are going to have an impact on more than one resource. So for example, if I delete an instance, uh, an Azure instance or, a, or an AWS instance, uh, then I need to also delete that from a pool of servers on my load balancer. Um, it, it, it works its way through that model, identifies all of the linkages together. It then validates that the changes you want to make are actually feasible. Like, so for example, you might, you might for example, do something that you can't do, try to delete something that can't be deleted without like a sequencing problem. It tries to puzzle out those sequences on its own, but sometimes it gets stuck because it's very, these can be very complex sort of things. It then comes up with effectively what is a, an execution plan, an order of things that it's going to do things. So it knows that I've got to delete this firewall rule before I delete this other object, and, I, and then I'm going to recreate this other thing before I, I, I can build this next thing. It then spits out to the user some output, which basically is a, uh, a plan saying this is the, what the end state will look like and here's the difference from the previous state. Um, you can save those plans too, importantly. The one of the really interesting things about Terraform is I, I can actually you know, plan out what's going to happen. I can save that plan and then I can take it somewhere else and execute it. So that might, as an example is a very good way of being able to treat um, Terraform changes very much like a patch management system. So I can create a local diff of the changes I can bundle those changes up and then apply them in production just like I would deploy a change set or a patch set um, on my environment. So I look at, I see the output, I look at that, I decide that, okay, 
it's going to change these three resources, it's going to update these two resources, it's going to leak this one resource um, and create some new resources. I'm, I'm comfortable that that's the right decision. Um, so then I go, okay, I'm going to run the Terraform apply command. It sucks in the same inputs, compares it against the state again, and then actually performs the action. So it actually executes the process. This podcast is supported by Atlantic.net, hosting solution provider of healthcare HIPAA, PCI compliance, and ad tech. If you're feeling the pain of having outdated technology, call Atlantic.net and get the latest security firewall, intrusion detection, backup, disaster recovery, and virtualization. Or if you're starting a new project or not getting the results you want from your current providers, Atlantic.net can help you succeed. With fully audited solutions and 23 years in business, they won't let you down. Visit Atlantic.net to learn more. You talked earlier about the idea of a graph being an important intermediate step. Let's start briefly define what a graph is, and then I'll talk uh, some more about how this graph figures into the Terraform plan. Sure. What Terraform uses the back end is effectively a dependency graph or a directed graph. So essentially it represents the dependencies of objects towards one another. Um, so you can actually derive like the, as I talked about before, the sort of it works out the order of things. It derives that order from the relationships or the dependencies between objects. So it, it knows, for example, that uh, in Azure land, if there's an Azure server, that Azure server has a bunch of dependent objects, for example, a firewall rule or a network interface. It knows that it can't delete the Azure object without deleting the network interface or the firewall first, for example. So it walks along the graph and says, this dependency uh, needs to happen before this other dependency. A graph, then it has nodes and edges. In this case, the nodes are resources that you're trying to create and edges are dependencies between these resources that would govern the order that they're created in or deleted in. Am I getting that right? Yeah, so I mean, essentially it's a set of vertices connected by edges. So a vertices nodes connect, connected by edges. And the edges have a have a, a relationship, a direction, a dependency with them, associated with them, so that so that those those nodes, you know, can be you, you know you know what sequence those nodes have to be touched in. Now in in Papa, which I'm more familiar with, it has a very similar model. You as a programmer are creating a lot of these edges yourself where you say this module I'm in, it needs these other modules to happen first. Or after I finish doing this thing in this module I'm in, then tell this other module that I'm done because it needs to know that yep. I'm done. Now in Terraform, do uh, the edges mostly result from things a programmer specified or does Terraform have some more built-in knowledge of the domain where it knows, okay, we need to do all the firewalls first before we set up the things that uh, are in this part of the network. Yeah, so the, that's probably the primary. I, I mean, otherwise, uh, I would say that Terraform and Puppet are, are near identical in their implementation approaches. The primary difference is, as you've said, in Puppet, um, it's very common uh, to have to actually declare relationships between objects. Um, and I think the primary reason for that is that most of the objects that you're managing in Puppet do not have a defined API. Um, so you, often if you look at a Puppet resource and drill down into the source code, ultimately you're shelling out to a Unix command or you're performing some action where you know it's hard to reason about what might happen as a result of that. Like lots of different, you could get lots of different responses from executing a user add command or a service start or stop command. And it's hard to model the variables out. Uh, if you're dealing with an infrastructure tool like like Azure or AWS, they have published and documented APIs. Um, they spit out error messages that that are uh, related to the, that that indicate the relationship between multiple objects. So you can actually introspect that API and know that um, in order to work with it, uh, you know this sequence of events is is possible. Whereas Puppet, it's a lot harder to introspect all of those different tools and command line scripts and and bits of, bits of um, configuration 
and, and make the same determination. So Terraform uh, tries to do all of that for you, hides it underneath the covers by doing that introspection of the API and making that determination. However, there are circumstances, particularly when you're dealing with resources across, uh, for example, you might be dealing with resources in Amazon, Google Cloud, and say a third party DNS provider. There are some cases where Terraform doesn't know that there's a, there should be a relationship there, in which case you can declare those dependencies. You can actually say, do this thing before this thing. A really common example in the Terraform world is, is um, create this new thing before you delete the old thing. So that's a common example, it might be a DNS entry. It's like, it's like a, a, you know, make sure you, you, you've, um, you know, you've created this new thing before you delete the old thing because break, deleting the old thing will break things or cause some un, unexpected behavior to happen. A Amazon auto scaling groups are another example. It's like, um, make sure, make sure you've, you've, uh, uh, you, you've, uh, you've got a new version of this before you blow the old version away and potentially stop the application. James, I can see if I start out with a bunch of resources and I have a bunch of facts like resource A needs to come before B and B needs to come before C. And then somewhere else I have X needs to come before Y and Y needs to come before Z. And after we've created everything, then we're all done. So I could turn that into some kind of graph. It seems like there could be more than one possible graph because not everything depends on everything. And so you could do things in different ways. Is is there an algorithm or are there known algorithms for graph synthesis from these partial little chunks of dependencies? Um, so uh, this is where my knowledge starts to get a little bit more theoretical. Um, there, there are definitely ways of, of, um, of, 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 of achieving that. and but. The interesting, the interesting part for me is that Puppet and Terraform both have an actual way to visualize the graph. Um, and this is something that I, I found is probably the easiest way to work out what's going on, is that you can actually spit out a, a picture of the, of the directed graph. Um, so you can actually say, you know, uh, if I make this change and I make this other change, generate me a picture that shows all the lines that join together my, my resources together. Um, uh, it is certainly possible, less so, uh, and less so with Puppet, but certainly possible with Terraform uh, to use it like a library, to include it in something else, and, and say, you know, make make reason about infrastructure underneath the covers for me. Um, so, for example, I, I might want to uh, I might want to treat it as a uh, I might want to treat it as a way to generate infrastructure for my platform or my service underneath the covers. Like uh, I might want to create. Docker containers or manage some sort of pool of resources. So there are definitely ways to programmatically include Terraform's uh, and, take, and take advantage of its its capabilities there. Um, but as to the specific algorithms, I would, I would have to go and Google something for you. Um, it's not an area I have an expertise. Okay, I have another graph related question. I'm building out a network. We've talked a lot about microservices, which have their own silo, they have their own storage. Say that I have my system, it's got five main subsystems and they're somewhat independent of each other. There's no reason that I would need to build them sequentially. Time to build, it's often minutes or if you add in puppet runs, can be tens of minutes for infrastructure. Is Terraform smart enough to look at the graph and say this chunk of the graph here, chunk one, chunk two, and chunk three, they are all able to run in parallel and they all need to be done at some point before we can proceed and say we're done. But uh, is it smart about parallelism? It is. Um, so uh, there's obviously a couple of constraints. Like, um, for example, uh, it might be possible to create those two resources in parallel, but the provider you use, may not, that may not be a capability it has. So, so the, with the, the constraint in mind that whatever infrastructure tool you're using at the other end, like Amazon or Azure, uh, may not allow you to parallelize those operations. Assuming that it does though, um, for example, it might be say, I, I want to create a thousand containers and it doesn't matter what they happen in because I don't need them until later when, when they're used by this load balancer. Um, so I'll create all of those in parallel, I'll create them all simultaneously rather than 
sequentially because um, the order is not important. But I won't create the load balancer until a thousand containers are created because that is something that I need to have in sequence. Okay, so we can save some time. And if somebody was trying to do this with a script, a Ruby script instead of a tool like Terraform that adding in parallelism and then synchronizing, that is a fairly complex type of programming something they ask you about a lot in programming job interviews because it's easy to have subtle bugs. Yeah. Classic old school sysadmins very commonly did things parallel operations by say SSH into um, SSH into secure shell by creating a, a, a script that SSH to like 30 machines simultaneously and did some action and then return the, the results of that action and, and then you tracked it as a, against the status on that. So that was a, was a pretty common phenomenon. It was a very fragile phenomenon. And uh, one that uh, you know required a fair bit of hard coding and, 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 and sort of fiddling to get right. I look at sort of massive parallel operations like and, and sequencing operations where you're trying to maintain state, or more importantly, pass the knowledge of one state to another. For example, every one of those thousand containers I need to create, I need to return some information about the state in order to populate the load balancer. For example, its IP address or its location or pass up possibly need to pass around some application configurations and environment variables, uh, maybe some authentication credentials. And I need to do that in such a way that I keep a, keep a running total of the numbers created, the data associated with each, um, and then I need to you know, make sure I step through all of those and identify where it hasn't worked. And you know, that, those, are, those are reasonably complicated dependency operations. Um, and honestly, I, I uh, I'm glad that someone else has to write the code to manage that for me because, uh, yes, subtle bugs uh, are, are definitely a problem, but even unsubtle bugs are often very hard to diagnose in that environment. Now, that is a great lead-in for another question I wanted to ask you. The how, how do you debug a declarative program when you tell it what you want, goes out and does all this stuff, and you're not getting the result that you think you want. What are some typical debugging techniques? Is there a debugger? That's another question. Does Terraform have a debugger? It doesn't have a debugger in the classic sort of programming language sense, but what, what it does have is that, well, first of all, it's pretty good about, and thankfully most of these infrastructure tools are pretty good about telling you what went wrong. So Terraform will, will, will try to do the best possible job it can. So in an imperative world, like usually if you get to the end of your, one of your steps fails, probably the whole program bombs out. Or worse, the program may continue and do something unexpected because one of the steps didn't work. In a declarative world like Terraform, generally speaking, you're firewalled off from the impacts of that because the resource that failed will generally only impact the resources that are, it is connected to on the graph. So a good example of this is Let's say I'm creating that, that, that environment of microservices where not all microservices are connected. And uh, let's say five out of six of them, uh, essentially they're, they're groups of five or six resources that make up a service and they're not interconnected. So if the sixth resource uh, fails for some reason, let's say I run out of capacity or something like that and the, the sixth service doesn't start, Terraform will happily create the other five services and report their success. Uh, and next time I run Terraform, It'll say, oh, no, those are all created. I'll jump straight to the one that needs help, and I'll recreate that, or I'll create that. Um, so usually speaking, I'm only getting an error message related to the thing that is broken. I'm getting a very clear thing that all of these other things got created, but this one thing didn't, and all of the things that are dependent on that, I, I know they're not going to be, I don't have to worry about debugging them because they've only got that to the fire of that resource. It, that significantly shrinks the surface area of my problem. Um, and generally speaking, I can narrow it down to this one resource didn't work. Uh, it didn't work because it's about this error out. Oh, if I fix that, then everything, that will resource will be recreated or created. And all of my dependent resources will then continue. And any other errors I will follow on. Rather than an imperative world where 10 things might have gone wrong. And I just have to sort of identify like how far did it get in the script? What happened? How do I interrogate that? And that's all recorded in Terraform state file too. So I can actually inspect the state file and identify what did or didn't happen. And for example, I can do things like, because that state file is a, it's just a, a blob of objects. So I can do things like, I would like to edit that state file to change something so that I can actually work around a bug, or I can delete a whole resource. So for example, I'd like 
there are problems to go back and recreate this thing because I fixed the problem. I delete the resource out of my state file. I rerun Terraform. Terraform interrogates the state file and says, oh, that resource isn't there anymore. Um, I should recreate that. So it's very powerful ways of sort of um, analyzing and looking at that data in, in a way you just can't with an imperative imperative step-by-step program. In the example we've been talking about where you have the five microservices that can be created in any order, from what you're saying, it, it sounds like if it's smart about parallelism, it will get as much done as it can in every independent branch. You don't have to decide, I'm going to create these in order, one, two, three, four, five, and oops, number one failed. Okay, fix that. Now number two failed. You could find out a lot of information uh, about what went wrong and proceed on all the things that are unblocked. Correct. So, you know, often I will identify something that's gone wrong in my, my Terraform run. I'll see an error message on the screen or something like that. But Terraform's continued because it has other work to do. Uh, I will jump onto the, a console or jump onto the, the code and I'll fix the problem. Terraform finishes running and I just rerun it to push the, the new change or, the, or to make the new change that I've identified live. Okay. Now, what language was Terraform implemented in? It's written in Go. And do you know, uh, I'm not sure if you were involved, were you involved in the product development at any point? Uh, I, I've been involved in as, you know, having an opinion. Uh, I would mm. definitely not claim to be, uh, you know, one of the primary primary movers behind it. Um, I will say that, I, you know, I, I had a fair bit to say about Puppet back in the day. It was one of the people that worked on a lot of that. And uh, I see a lot of that heritage in, in Terraform, which pleases me. What do you think were lessons learned from Puppet that have made Terraform what it is? I think probably the big one is is the dependency uh, the dependency model. Um, you know, being a long time Puppet user, I'm, I'm it's hard for me to sometimes be empathetic towards people who are like, you know, I have to declare all the dependencies because it's just instinct to me. I, I just, you know, I type. It's like a, you know, you, you, you just type out the bits you need. But definitely for people starting with Puppet, like it was often very hard to be like, I ran my Puppet run three times and three different things happened. And you're like, well, we just need to, you know, state what the dependencies are. And people are like, well, that's silly. Why doesn't it just know? And I think that's terrible. been a big stumbling block for a lot of people adopting Puppet that is less so about Terraform. And, and I think that makes Terraform quite attractive to the people because they don't have to worry about the detail. Terraform will, you know, 99% of the time do the right thing. Another thing I've observed in Puppet, there's something which sounds very similar in spirit to me to provider where if Puppet doesn't know about a certain type of thing, like I was dealing with something in Linux called a capability, mm -hmm. and there wasn't, that wasn't known to Puppet, you can write a custom piece of Ruby that enables you to declaratively say capability of this user to do some mm -hmm. operation on this process. You can, that's moderate amount of work. But there's this universal escape hatch where you can say, run this program, it's called exec, and it will escape from the declarative world into the imperative world and just do this side thing that who knows what it does, what side effect it has. Is there some kind of an escape hatch out of the declarative world in Terraform? Sort of, um, uh, less so than Puppet perhaps, but so, so to be really clear, Terraform and Puppet are very similar tools, but probably do subtly different, slightly different things. Uh, Terraform is much more focused on infrastructure, so it's much more of the sort of, you know, servers, databases, uh, message queues, um, DNS entry sort of level. Puppet is much more aimed at the con individual configuration items, like for example, this this is the this is the, the IP address of my NTP server, or this is the IP address of the authentication server. Let's populate that into my application configuration. So Terraform has a concept called provisioners. And provisioners are include very similar to what you've described. And in fact, it is even called exec, where it allows you to run an arbitrary command and perform some action. You can also use things like exec um, to connect to existing configuration management tools. So I can, for example, create a bunch of servers with Terraform and then launch Puppet on those servers to do my more granular configuration. And that, that allows me to sort of address the things that, you know, are, are not 
sort of available as resources. I can manipulate those. Terraform also has a concept of very similar to Puppet of templating. So I can do things like create configuration files, configuration objects as templates, uh, and then I can pass in variables in Terraform and populate those templates. So for example, I might create a configuration file that I would like to include on a, on a server uh, inside Terraform and use Terraform's template function to write that to the server. Okay, I wanted to finish up with something that might be a bit philosophical. One of my other hosts on this show point out to me that declarative programming is becoming increasingly popular. The field of programming itself is every year becoming more specialized and has more niches. Depending on where you worked and what you worked on, you know certain languages, certain systems, and not other systems. Do you see a point where there will be people whose job is programmer and they don't need to know an imperative language at all? Or to use these tools, do you really need to understand what it's doing at the bottom layer? And it's saving you a lot of time, but you could do it yourself if you needed to. I'd argue those people are already here. I've worked with a number of data people, for example, who are amazing with SQL, can do incredible things with it. They have no idea how a database works. They have no idea about scaling a database or even how it's configured. And they have no idea what happens to beyond a sort of superficial level. Some of them are very smart too, but a lot of them have no idea about the detail uh, underneath the surface. But they know how to turn you know, a, a multi-line, hugely complex SQL query uh, into a, a consumable report. So those people exist here and now. And I think there are, uh, in our current world, a number of engineers, for example, who combine high-level functions and libraries into into uh, and components into other things. Um, you could argue anyone working in the DOM, uh, anyone working in the sort of the front end world where they're working in the browser DOM, is in fact you know they don't really you know it's a, it's a virtual machine that 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 displays content. It, it, like they don't know how beyond. I, if I ask most front end engineers, there's a fairly loose understanding of what's happening underneath, particularly junior ones and. You know, the common question of what happens when you type a URL into the browser and hit enter is a common interview question. I find that that uh, at a certain level, what I consider sort of the back end or the infrastructure, a lot of front engineers are fairly hazy about what's happened. But inside the DOM, they know very well how to manipulate that and do that. And they don't need to know the low level detail because someone else takes care of that. I don't necessarily see that as a bad thing, but I definitely see it as something that, that is likely to increase. You know, we all you know we all tend to be reasonably, the industry tends to reasonably specialize things. There's huge bodies of knowledge. I'm very skeptical of the full stack engineer term, for example. I think there's a spectrum. Uh, I'm definitely on the infrastructure back end engineer side of things. No one's going to ever make me design something or write JavaScript uh, if they can avoid it. But I know lots of back end engineers who maybe aren't as infrastructure centric as me, but know some back end stuff, like lots of Ruby and Rails developers know some back end stuff but are sufficiently skilled that they can sort of reach up into the JavaScript world and maybe the design world a little bit, but they definitely couldn't debug a kernel problem. So I think that that, that spectrum will, will always exist and definitely people will build abstraction layers that other people will put together and that you know, that's a, a natural evolution. That's a great place to stop, James. Before we wrap up, could you tell listeners where they can find your books and where can they find you on the web? Sure. Um, I'm on Twitter as uh, K-A-R-T-A-R. The Terraform book is available at terraformbook.com. It's also available on Amazon, Google, and Nook. Nook, if anyone still uses Nook. And, uh, I don't think so. I don't think so either, but uh, I still keep it there. I sell one copy of it in a blue moon. And generally speaking, all of my sites and so forth are linked from one of those. Uh, always happy to hear from readers, always happy to hear from folks who, who uh, have feedback about any of the books I've written or ideas that uh, would make them better. My, my process is very collaborative where possible and I, I'm, I'm always keen to, to hear from folks who struggled through something or didn't understand something. Uh, I very much aim for that sort of brand new beginner community. All of my books, particularly the Terraform and Puppet books were generally aimed at or are aimed at absolute beginners. You, I, I don't expect you've ever seen Terraform before you start reading the book. Um, so I'm always keen to hear from people when they have struggles or challenges or things that I can make easier. We are adopting Terraform at my current job. I'm definitely in that beginner category. 
I've read the book and I can attest it is definitely aimed at somebody getting started in Terraform and will get you from the zero to the one uh, in that technology. So uh, really encourage people to read that book. Is there anything else you'd like to say, James, before we finish? No, um, thank you very much for having me back again. Um, it's one of my favorite podcasts, so I really enjoy being here. Thank you so much for speaking to us at Software Engineering Radio. For Software Engineering Radio, this has been Robert Blumen. Thank you for listening. Help us make SE Radio even better by completing our short listener survey at www.ieee.org slash SE Radio. Thanks. Thanks for listening to SE Radio, an educational program brought to you by IEEE Software Magazine. For more about the podcast, including other episodes, visit our website at se-radio.net. To provide feedback, you can comment on each episode on the website or reach us on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, or through our Slack channel at seradio.slack.com. You can also email us at team at se-radio.net. This and all other episodes of SE Radio is licensed under Creative Commons License 2.5. Thanks for listening. <laughs>